Hey everybody, welcome to the GMG Review. Today we're taking a look at Kill Team Nightmare, skirmish combat in the 41st millennium. So this is the new Night Lords versus Mandrakes with the Nightmare Genitorium Hub. Um, Generatorium Hub, sorry. <laughs> Piece of terrain, which will expand to the, um, it's the uh, Beta Decima terrain set. You're gonna get all the cool new stuff that come in these box sets. You're gonna get the rule book, data cards for all of your Kill Team members, which is the biggest quality of life improvement in this new splash of Kill Team. As well as counters and decks of cards for those miniatures. So, what do we got? Well, we've got the, I think this is probably the like leadership accessory. I don't know if this is like a bespoke kill team one. It might be, but it might come in the same uh, box set for these when they come out. Uh, I think it does, because this is two total frames, which is usually how these kits come um, for the Night Lords. So you get the Night Lords frame themselves, which is their bodies, their backpacks, their weapons, their torsos, uh, which allows you to build 10 Night Lords. Then you get their cool helmets, uh, although the helmets are, are are like sometimes half helms as well, which I think is kind of neat. So you've got some bear heads with like the wings and stuff still on them. An icon bear with like an Astartes torso hanging off it, a uh, big giant chain glaive, because that's obviously, uh, I think, like a, a signature weapon for the Night Lords, a poison blade. Um, so they seem to have included all of the, and as well as like the, the talons, the like, like lightning claws too, all of the sort of signature hallmark Night Lords weapons that you could expect to see on this frame. Um, the shoulder pads have the Night Lords symbol like etched onto them. And then on top of that, you get some icons, some chaos icons. You can make this entire kit with both uh, close combat weapons and bolt pistols, or you can take it with um, bolters. So you do get the option of all of those kind of types of weapons. They are pretty melee focused, but they do have a missile launcher available uh, and a heavy bolter on this same frame. So you can make a bunch of special weapons as well. And we get the Mandrakes. They're a little simpler, if I'm being honest. Um, there's only like one full frame worth of guys in here. So you're looking at uh, 10 Mandrakes yet again. There are some kind of specialty things with like the cloaks. Um, you get some options with the weapons and stuff too. And then this is like your, your leader guy. There's, two, there's a single model on here you can build. Um, or maybe it's two? No, it's two. No, it's one. <laughs> this, is, this is the leader guy frame um, that gets you the additional sort of stuff to make your boss. Uh, and on top of that, we get our Nightmare Generatorum. Uh, you can see here it's just a single large punch piece and then these are like the bottom pieces so all of this stuff is like the skirting and it goes along the bottom here um, to make it stand up which is a nice sizable train piece and also covers a water feature on the table which removes some of the water and gives you kind of like a with cover up and down sort of corridor that you can move through while you're on the table which is pretty handy cast basement transfers all your bases and that is it for what's in the box so let's take a look at the book so you get kind of a cool little case for all your stuff this time around and it's I, it's hard card so like you could definitely keep this for later if you wanted to uh, and this is going to contain all your accessories for both these teams so first you got your night lords uh strats you've got your um mandrakes and we got our stat cards here our building instructions all of our tokens this is such a quality life improvement objectives um all your gear and item tokens for the gear and items um and then your uh your beautiful ones for the the skin flanks like out of space monsters that are the mandrakes um so let's go through this stuff what's great is i love not having to necessarily use the book to go through these things anymore so going through the book what i'm going to look at is i'm going to look at the composition then i'm going to use the cards to actually show you everything um and then we'll jump into the uh, strats and stuff on top of that actually we'll do the composition then we'll do the strats then we'll do the rest um so the rules so first we'll do the night lords the nemesis claw kill team so you get to have a Night Lord's Visionary and five Nemesis Claw members. Uh, other than the Warrior, which is the bottom here, can have the Bolt Pistol, Chain Sorter, Bolt Gun, and Fists. You can have one of the Ventrilocar, a Skin Thief, a Screecher, a Heavy Gunner, a Gunner, or a Fearmonger. So those guys can all be uh, your, your basic dudes. The Gunner can have a Flamer, Melted Gunner, Plasma Gun, which is on there, and the Missile Launcher and Heavy Bolter, obviously for the Heavy. And then your uh, Night Lord's Visionary can have a Power Weapon, a Power Maul, Bolt, uh, Power Fist, or a Plasma Pistol, and a Strawman Chain Blade. These are our options. So like all Space Marine Kill teams, we're talking about six models. And then we're into our ploys. So strategic ploys, our tactical ploys, and our equipment. 
Uh, their core ability is in Midnight Clad. When determining if a friendly Nemesis Claw operative is in an enemy operative's line of sight, that friendly operative is obscured if all the following are true. It has a conceal order. It's within one inch of a heavier light terrain feature and has any part of its base underneath the vantage point and or has any part of its base under vantage point and it's more than six away. So basically, if you're under, over six away, you're under something or you're within an inch of something, you're invisible because you're a weird space vampire. <laughs> um, these are all our token guides and stuff too. And we'll get the tax off and attack ops in a second. So st starting off with our um, strategic ploys, uh, we're looking to actually start. We start with the attack ops actually, because that's going to give us what we're playing for. So, so terror. Uh, this is for the nemesis claw. It's a faction one. Realist attack up if the on the target reveal step of any turning point. If a friendly nemesis claw operative in, uh, in incapacitates an enemy operative within engagement range, and that operative is within white of an objective marker that's both in your opponent's uh, territory and not in the center line, you score VP, and you get it in any subsequent turn. You get to do it again. So basically, uh, if you if you make an example out of somebody next to an objective. <laughs> Uh, Dread Tail, Dark Rumor, uh, if the, uh, reveal this attack up at the end of the battle. If a friendly Nemesis Claw Operative is within red of your opponent's kill zone, get one. If a friendly Nemesis Claw Operative is within red of an enemy operative, you also score one. So be near somebody and be near the table edge because you're just terrifying. <laughs> and then Hunt the Weak. Uh, if a friendly Nemesis Claw Operative incapacitates an enemy operative within its engagement range, that has an unmodified wound characteristic of seven, and that enemy operative is within uh, red of from all other enemy operatives, you score BB. Basically, if you like kidnap somebody who's not near somebody else, if you achieve the first condition at any subsequent turning point, you score an additional VP. So you hunt people that are alone and by themselves. All right, so our strategic ploys for start of turn. Uh, we get Nightmare Manifest for one CP. Until the end of the turning point, friendly Nemesis Claw operatives can perform two fight actions during their activation or two shoot actions during their activation if a bolt weapon is selected. So basically, the, the Space Marine rapid fire. Uh, one for We've Come For You. Um, so sorry. Uh, if you're doing fight act, it's, it's for both. I should say it's not like the Space Marine one because it's one CP, but you get to do two fight actions all the time with everybody or two shoot actions if you have a bolt weapon. So basically you combine those two abilities into a single CP, which is amazing. Um, you have We've Come For You until the end of the turning point each time a friendly Nemesis Cooperative is activated. Uh, if the first action is, performs during the activation is a charge action, after it finishes the activation or the action, you can select one enemy operative within uh, engagement to take D3 mortal wounds. Basically, you just jump on the guy and choke him out. <laughs> And then Prey Sight until the end of the turning point when uh, determining the line of sight for each friendly Nemesis Claw Operative. Enemy Operatives within red are treated as having engage order unless they're in cover uh, from heavy terrain. So if you're concealed behind light cover, they have like predator vision. They can just see you, <laughs> which is crazy. And then the Black Hunt for 1 CP until the end of the turning point. Each time a friendly Nemesis Claw Operative fights in combat or makes a shooting attack against an enemy operative that has less than a starting number of wounds, so if you're like already hurt, um, at the start of the combat or shooting attack and the roll attack dice step, you can reroll one of your attack dice. So basically, see, uh, reroll against wounded guys, see everything, um, get mortal wounds on your charges, or just fight twice with all the weapons you're probably equipped with that aren't heavy or gun weapons. They have amazing strategic ploys. <laughs> like, amazing strategic ploys. And then your attack ploys, out of the darkness for one. Uh, use this uh, tactical ploy at the start of the scouting step. One friendly nemesis cooperative, wholly within your drop zone, can perform a free normal move of up to two white as though it could fly. So a four inch fly move. Uh, you're Batman, basically. <laughs> tactical ploy, Vox Scream. Use this tactical ploy when your opponent would activate an enemy operative. Your opponent cannot uh, uh, activate that operative in this activation. If there's no other enemy operatives eligible to be activated, then this can't be done. Like, you can't use this tactical ploy. Uh, it costs one additional command point for each previous time you use it during the battle. Um, so basic, and they don't, it doesn't say they choose somebody else, it's just for a CP, you can't activate somebody and get to go again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah. They just can't operate and oper activate somebody. And you could like save up your CPs and do it a bunch of times. If I'm reading that right, but I might need some clarity on that one. And there's no additional description to it in the, in the book that I could find. Um, Tactical Boy, Death of the False Emperor. Use tactical ploy after uh, shooting, after rolling attack dice for a combat involving um, or shooting attack made by a friendly nemesis claw operative. Uh, if the enemy operative has the Imperium keyword, in the shoot, uh, roll attack dice step of the combat or shooting, you can reroll any or all of your attack dice. A result of one result, and if it's a Stardis, you can just reroll all of them. <laughs> so basically, it's it's good against Imperium. It's even better against other Stardis. And then finally, proclivity for murder. They have some great names for these. 
Uh, uses tactical deploy after a friendly nemesis cooperative incapacitates an enemy operative within its engagement range. That friendly operative can immediately perform a free charge action up to blue or a free dash action, even if it is performed an action during that activation that prevents it from performing a charge or a dash action. So basically, like, you get a little free something if you want to go do it. Um, getting a free charge, and, and remember, with a with a, a strategic play, you can fight twice. So you could charge CP to like kill someone with a fight action, and because you have three actions, you could then get a free charge action up to blue, and then or a free dash action, and then get to fight again because you're able to fight twice. So it's basically allowing you to charge, move three, fight again if you want after you after you've already fought. All right, and then we're into our equipment. Um, and of course, as they are Night Lords, they have freaky equipment. <laughs> so we're talking about uh, Flayed Skin. Uh, it's two EPs, not available for anyone with a Grizzly Trophy, because you've already got something. While this operative is visible and within uh, blue of an enemy operative, your opponent cannot reroll attack or defense dice for that enemy operative. You're just watching people's skin come off. A uh, Grizzly Trophy, again, you can't combine them. While this operative is visible within blue of an enemy operative, they're minus one attack for melee weapons and ranged weapons. You're just, you're terrifying. Uh, even the Space Marines. Uh, then Chain Snare, the operative gains the following ability for the battle. While only one enemy operative is within engagement range of this operative, that enemy operative is snared. Each time a snared operative would perform a fallback action, roll a d6, subtracting one if, uh, this op if that enemy operative has a higher wound characteristic than this operative, and adding one if that enemy operative is injured. Um, on four plus, the enemy operative cannot perform the action, but no action points are subtracted. Basically, you just stop people from moving away. Uh, then you get a Heavy Gunner, uh, suspenser system, so this is the same as the normal one. Um, the heavy special rule for this operative's range weapon is treated differently. Instead of the operative cannot move more than three in the same activation, um, in which it performs a shoot action with any of those range weapons. So basically, just it slows you down a little bit, not all the way. Combat blade, it's the standard one, four attacks, three plus, three, five for one. Frag grenade, same as a frag grenade. Crack is same as a crack grenade. So what you have is you have a very versatile Astartes unit here. And when we start looking at their actual stat lines, you'll see why. All right, let's jump into these guys. So <laughs> I'm going to start with the boss, because these are not in any particular order right now, because I've been playing with them. Uh, Lord Visionary, here he is. So standard Marine stat line, three movement, three APL, um, one uh, like a group activate, and then three defense, three plus, 13 wounds. Can have bolt pistol, it's the usual bolt pistol, plasma pistol, a power fist or power weapon. The Nostrom and chain blade though, five attacks, two plus, four, five damage rending. That's real decent for also getting the plasma pistol on there. I think I would pretty much always take it. Um, five attacks, twos with a base four damage. I mean, it's as good as the rest of them really. It's as, almost as good as a power weapon with rending. Um, Lethal five plus is great for not being able to be blocked, but I think it's just fine for also having the option of a plasma pistol. I think that's how I'd build him, and also it's just like kind of the, the 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 coolest looking. Uh, a Night Lord's Fearmonger, so core style is the same except one less wound because he's not the champion. He's got a scoped bull pistol, so it's a regular bull pistol with lethal five plus, but you can also fire it at long range, which is very nice. So it gets to shoot like a bolter almost. Uh, then Terror Chem Vial because he's got drugs. Uh, it's a five dice, three plus, two zero damage. So base two damage, has no critical damage though. It's range three, blast, indirect, uh, mortal wounds three, terror chem, <laughs> limited and no cover. So now terror chem, which we'll have to look up, is Night Lord's Fearmonger. That's the screecher, Fearmonger. So terror chem is each time the operative fights in combat or makes a shooting attack with this weapon, in the resolve successful hit step of the combat or shooting attack, that first time you resolve a critical hit, the enemy operative gains one terror chem token uh, until the end of the battle if it doesn't already have one. And then terror chem poison, in the ready operative step of the initiative phase, enemy operatives with the terror chem token suffer D3 mortal wounds, even if this operative's been incapacitated, because you're poisoned. Um, oh, it is all in the back, never mind, I have to look them up. Uh, and then your Tainted Blade also does Terra Chem, um, and it's a 5 attack, 3 plus, 3 5 damage. You've also got Poison Objectives. Select one objective token marker this operative controls that doesn't have a Terra Chem token. It gains one of your Terra Chem tokens. The first time an enemy operative within, uh, without a Terra Chem token moves within white of the objective marker, it suffers D3 mortal wounds and gains that Terra Chem token, which will also do D3 wounds. And it gains it until the end of the battle. This operative cannot perform this action while within engage range of an enemy operative. If you poison one of the objectives, it is, you're always taking this guy. He's amazing. Like, you would always take him because poisoning the objectives makes them, like, untouchable. I would sprint him into poison something at the start of the game. Uh, you got your gunner. He's just a marine with a special weapon. He's got no special rules. Heavy gunner, same thing with a heavy bolter and a plasma rifle. Or, uh, sorry, a heavy bolter and a missile launcher, rather. 
A skin thief, yeah, because because that's not disturbing. He's got like hands on him and stuff. Uh, he's got the chain glaive, so he's got five attacks, three plus four, six with reap one and rending. Uh, and then he's got his an action, flay them alive. Once per turning point when this operative incapacitates an enemy operative, so it's not an action. Uh, within its engagement range, select one enemy operative visible to and within red of the objective uh, of this operative and the or the incapacitated enemy operative. Until the start of the next turning point, that operative cannot perform mission actions or pickup actions or control objective markers. You just freak them out with what you're doing to that guy. <laughs> Make an example out of him. And then Tyrant of the Skinning Pits. Each time this operative fights in combat, subtract one from both the damage characteristics of seven hit operative's weapons uh, to a minimum of two. So, yeah, if you get hit by guys in melee, you just don't care. Uh, the Screecher, I love this guy because he's the one that kind of looks like Kurz. Um, he's got Lightning Claws, so five attacks, three plus, four or five damage, lethal five plus, and Relentless, so reroll on everything. Um, he's got a Screech, uh, again, of course, outlines are the same for all these Marines. Uh, Screecher, while this operative is within blue um, of any enemy operative, worse than the blue skill and weapon skill characteristic of that enemy operative's weapons by one, and this is not cumulative with being injured. Uh, an appetite for cruelty each time this operative fights in combat as an active op operative. If the target has less than a starting number of wounds remaining at the start of the combat, this operative's lightning claws gain lethal 4 plus instead of lethal 5 plus. That is crazy. Then we've got the Lord of Ventrilocar. Um, and sorry, I'm just going to put that guy back where he's supposed to be. <laughs> um, he is, again, regular course out with the bull pistol and chancer. He's got your icon. Uh, your icon has a has a space marine that's screaming on it. <laughs> He's an icon bearer. When determining control of objective marker, treat his APL as being one higher. I uh, note this is not a modifier. In narrative play, this is cumulative with focus battle honor. So you could be um, total APL of five with this guy. And then he's got disconcerting mimicry. Basically, he makes the space marine talk. It's a psychic action. It's like one enemy operative within red. Then it's like one of the following enemy uh, for the op enemy operative to do. Either subtract one for their APL, change its order, or perform a free dash action with it. Specify the location for your opponent to move it to. This operative cannot perform this while in engagement range. So basically, he uses the space marine on the icon to, to make people do things. Uh, we got a visionary. Uh, sorry, that's the Lord visionary. That's the, the boss, and then the, the warriors there too. And they can have bolt pistol and chain sword, um, or bolt gun and chain fist, or bolt bolt gun and fist. And that's it. So that's the Night Lords. Man, oh man, what a cool team. Um, they're kind of just Space Marines Plus. And again, with 10 models in the box, you're gonna be able to build all the options. So you'll be able to build, there's the visionary you have to take, you get the fearmonger, you get the skin thief, the screecher, and the ventriloquar. So that's gonna be one, two, three, four, five guys. I think you, like, if you're not gonna do melee, you don't need this guy that much. But these five guys, plus you either pick a gunner, which I don't think you need both of. I honestly think the gunner's probably better than the heavy gunner. Although having some overwatch could be too, like, you're just gonna swap these guys in. I don't see you ever using the warriors, if I'm honest, because you're only getting six guys. So, like, you're building them all because it's kind of like a Night Lord's tactical squad, and then you're not using most of these for the, the core kill team. Not that you couldn't, but there, there's not really a reason to take a guy with a bull pistol and chain sword over the guy with lightning claws if you're trying to make a melee guy. Um, it's pretty exciting. They do have some neat additional stuff too for campaigns that's in here. So they get the campaign actions. Uh, they can do a reign of terror operation where uh, complete five games in which you scored victory points from So Terror, Dread Tale, Dark Rumor, and or upload viral code. Then Terror Incarnate, complete a tactic uh, game in which you scored route. And then finally, uh, your commendation is you can get eight XP uh, on your operatives, and then uh, it's considered a purge order. Or a slow and terrible end, plucked like eyes, complete five games in which you score victory points from capture hostages and infiltrate, hunt the weak, or rob and ransack, and then complete something where you do uh, plant the banner. It's called Grimry, and you stick the body somewhere everybody can find it, which is great. Uh, your battle honors are things like Masters of Stealth. You always have a, sorry, when you have a Conceal Order, you always have a Conceal Order, regardless of Vantage. Uh, Prey Stalker, you can charge even when you're concealed, which is really cool. Spiteful Hunter, uh, charge with an engagement range at one with the darkness. Uh, each time a shooting attack is made against this operative in the roll defense dice step, before rolling your defense dice, if it's in cover, you can do one of the following, either retain additional success um, or retain a crit save instead of a normal save as a result of cover. Uh, so these are neat, and then like you get weird, uh, like rare equipment too, like the Elixir of Misery. Keep a Misery Tally for this operative. Each time an operative is incapacitated, add one to the Misery Tally. Uh, once for battle, when this operative is activated, you can use this ability. If you do so, you regain up to, uh, up to your Misery Tally and wounds to a maximum of eight. So it's just cool, weird Night Lord stuff. Um, your assets are things like a Carrion Thicket. 
Uh, the Nightwings have festooned the area with the torture twisted remains of their victims. <laughs> At the end of the setup, barricade step, set up one of your cadaver tokens, uh, more than red from the opponent's drop zone. While well, the enemy operative is within blue of your cadaver token, that enemy operative is treated as being injured regardless of any rules that make it not injured. <laughs> However, do not subtract uh, white from its movement as a result of your, uh, unless it's activated within blue of the cadaver token. Because you basically just like, you leave bodies everywhere. Um, and I think that's great. Because why not leave bodies everywhere for people to find? They're, I, I really like them. I think they're a great uh, thematic, weird, you know, dark, like, army. <laughs> they're, just, they're just weird and cool. Uh, so let's take a look at the Mandrakes. All right, so for the Mandrake kill team, we're looking at one Night Fiend, who's your leader, and then eight Mandrakes. Uh, so you're getting a total of nine out of the ten, and you can choose Mandrake Abyssals, Chooser of the Flesh, Dirge Moss, Sh Shade Weaver, and Warriors. So basically, you're going to get five plus four Warriors, because um, you only get each one once. Uh, your abilities that you're looking at are Shadow Passage. One friendly Mandrake operative can perform the following action during each turning point. Uh, shadow Passage for 1 AP. If this operative is within Shadow, perform a free move, um, with, but instead of moving it, uh, remove it from the kill zone and set it up again within Shadow, of, uh, not within engagement of, and line of sight of an enemy model. It cannot make shooting attacks until the next turning point. So within Shadow, it counts as within one of a heavy terrain feature, um, and that part is not lower than it. Any part of its base is underneath a vantage point. It's within, uh, sorry, it's within um, triangle of a sh shadow portal token. Um, see the Shade Weaver Operations open shadow portal. So you can make these points that you can basically duck through, or you can jump within white, or it's not within white, within triangle of a heavy train feature. So there's lots of heavy train in this battle pack in particular, because the whole like gener generatorum, gen generatorum is a heavy train feature, which lets you basically bamf around like Nightcrawler. That's, that's your thing. And you can make points to it from too. Then you get Umbral Entities. Uh, you have a 5 plus invulnerable save, and if you're in Shadow, you have a 4 plus invulnerable save. So you're always getting your save, which is super handy. You get Soul Strike. Um, Mandrake's uh, operatives have ranged weapons with the Soul Strike special rule. Each time a friendly operative in a, makes a shooting attack with such a weapon, in the roll defense dice step with that shooting attack, successful saves are determined differently. Invulnerable saves can't be used. Each result that's equal or less than the target's APL is a successful save and is retained. Each result that's higher than the target's APL is discarded. Each retained result of a one is a critical save. So you're trying to roll under your APL for saves instead of using your actual save stat. So basically they just completely ignore armor and it's how fast can you get out of the way of these things, which is amazing. All right, so we've already done the abilities. There's our token guide as well. Faction tack ops. So the first thing you're playing for is death from darkness. Uh, reveal at the reveal step of any turning point. If a friendly Mandrake operative is activated within shadow, perform the charge action, incapacitates an enemy operative, and ends his activation within shadow, score BP. So you're trying to lure people near heavy objects, charge them, or the, or the portal token too, charge them and kill them to get VPs, and if you do it again, you get another one. Uh, shadow is reach. At the end of the turning point, if friendly Mandrake operatives control a terrain feature wholly within your opponent's territory that has parts of the heavy trait, you score one VP. You're trying to get to the shadows. And you can achieve the first condition with a different terrain feature at the end of any subsequent turns, get an extra VP. So basically, if you can control the heavy terrain features on the table, if there's more than one, you'll get it. If the terrain features don't have one, though, or only have one like this is, you might not want to take that tack off. Haunting Manifestation. At the end of any turning point, uh, if a friendly Mandrake operative is visible and within blue of the enemy operative, you score VP. If you <laughs> achieve the first condition, um, and at the end of the battle, that enemy operative has not been incapacitated, score VP. You're a Haunting Manifestation. <laughs> So you're basically trying to not kill somebody, you're trying to haunt them. You're trying to be within blue of them and not kill them, which is very funny. Have them see you. But you have to select an enemy operative to do it to. So you're trying to, you know what you do it to? You do it to like the cat. You do it to like the, all the non-lethal stuff that some of the warbands have and just like follow it around because it can't hurt you. Uh, and then your strategic ploy is you've got four like everybody else. You get creeping horror for one CP until the end of the turning point. After each enemy operative's activation, before the next operative is activated, you can perform a free dash action with one friendly mandrake that has a conceal order and starts its end, uh, and end ends its activation within shadow. So basically, the whole turn, every time you activate somebody, somebody else makes a dash, which is very cool. Um, each friendly operative can only be done this once per point, once per turning point, though. But it means that like your entire group basically is going to get to make that dash at some point. Gloaming Shroud until the end of the turning point. Each time a shooting attack is made against a friendly Mandrake operative within shadow, and the roll defense dice step before rolling your defense dice, you can retain additional save without rolling it. Uh, Blade in the Dark, at the end of the turning point, friendly Mandrake operatives that have a concealer can perform a charge action if they start and or end within shadow. So basically, you can conceal and charge as long as you're nearby something that has the, the shadow, it's heavy and you're within one of it. 
And then strategic ploy, inescapable nightmare until the end of the turning point. Each time a friendly Mandrake operative within shadow fights in combat or makes a shooting attack in the roll attack dice step of the combat or shooting attack, you can reroll one of your attack dice. So be fightier, be more defensive against shooting. Free charges um, are all like super handy. And then your attack boy, Sligger, Slither Out of Sight for 1 CP. Uses tactical ploy at the end of any operative's activation. Select one friendly Mandrake operative as an engage order and is within shadow. Change its operative's order to conceal. Then we've got Soul Feast for 1 CP. Uses tactical ploy at the end of the resolve successful hit step of a combat involving or shooting attack made by a friendly Mandrake. Um, against an enemy operative within red. That friendly operative gains a number of lost wounds uh, equal to the number of operatives APL multiplied by the number of the attack dice that inflicted damage in the combat group. Excess attack dice are no. So basically, when you do damage, you take the amount of damage that you did, uh, sorry, the number of attack dice that you landed, multiply it by, because you're using your, your soul steel, soul shear guns, multiply it by, or not guns, they're your Hadoukens basically, multiply it by the, their APL and you get that many wounds back. You eat them with your, your Hadoukens. Uh, tactical Blight, nowhere to hide. Use a Tactical Blight when a friendly Mandrake operative performs an action in which it moves. Until the end of that activation, you can move through terrain features if it wasn't there. So basically you just like walk through walls. And then Shadow's Bite, use a Tactical Blight after an enemy operative performs the charge action. When the fight action, and, uh, and then the fight action, and selects a friendly Mandrake operative within Shadow as the target for this combat. So if someone tries to fight you. In the resolve successful hit step of the combat, you are the attacker. <laughs> if both operatives have this rule, uh, it has no effect on both operatives. So basically, you can turn yourself into the attacker <laughs> and do all your hits first. And then we got our equipment. So chain snare. Uh, oh wait, yeah, that's Mandrakes. So chain snare. It's kind of the same as the other one. If you try and fall back, roll a d6, subtracting one. It's basically just can't do it. So you have the same chain snare. It looks like. Unless did I see the chain? I think you both have chain snares, which is very funny. Uh, frag grenades, flayed skin, grizzly trophy, chain snare. Yeah, no, you both just have chain snares, apparently. <laughs> you can both rip people around. Let me double check in the book that that's actually there. Now that I read that out loud, I'm not a, I'm not a hundred percent sure that those things exist in both things. Uh, chain web. No, Nemesis Claw is chain web. They have something different. So the cards are misprinted. Uh, chain web is two EPs until the unless they begin a move outside this operative's engagement range, you can fly. Enemy operatives cannot leave your engagement range. So the the, the Nemesis Claw one is you just can't leave. The Mandrax one is the one I read before actually, which is the um, the the grab you and and on a four plus you can't perform your action, but you don't lose any any points. The the, the, the night ones were just we're space marines and we we got you on a hook. You can't leave. Um, that sucks that that card's misprinted though. Um, equipment haunting projection. That's one AP. Uh, select one objective marker within red of this operative until the end of the battle when determine control of the objective marker. If this operative is in the kill zone, treat enemy operatives total APL as being one less. And this operative can only perform this action once because you poison the objective marker. A lot of like messing with objectives in these two decks. Then we have Shadow Glyph. While this operative is a conceal order, its tree is always having a conceal order. So that one's three. Uh, we got Spectral Essence. Each time this operative performs the dash action, it can move an additional one. Soul Gem for two, select a Bale Blast the operative is equipped with. The weapon gains the Blast one inch special rule for the battle. That's super handy because you can combine that with the healing. Um, actually, you could combine that with the healing actually and just suck a bunch of wounds out of people. And then Bone Darts. Uh, it's the falling range weapon. Basically, you're, you're firing little like, it's, it's Bone Dart from, uh, from Frostgrave. Four attacks, three plus, two, three damage, but it's silence. You can do it while you're concealed, limited in range one. So once per game, you can just throw little bone spikes at people, which is very neat. So let's look at our actual warrior. So the leader guy here is the Night Fiend. He's got a Bale Blast. So this is the standard Bale Blast they all got. So it has the Stole Strike special rule. It means it uses your APL as your defense. You have to roll under it. Uh, it's got four attacks, three plus, three, four damage. The Husk Blade is kind of like a power sword. So five attacks, two plus, four, six, lethal, five plus, and stun. And his abilities are Harrowing Whispers. Each time your opponent would activate uh, a ready enemy operative within red, you can roll a d6. And the result's greater than their APL. They cannot activate. If there's no other enemy officers to activate, this has no effect. So it switches you over to somebody else, which I think what the other one does too. The Screamer on the Night Lords. Because typically when you can't activate somebody, it still lets you pick somebody else. Uh, and then the Oobliex. At the start of each turning point, if this operative uh, incapacitates an enemy operative with its Husk Blade, its Oobliex becomes active. While it's active, each time an attack dice would inflict damage on this operative, you can roll 1d6. On a 5+, plus, ignore the damage inflicted by the attack, and this operative's Oobliex is no longer active. So you get a 5+, plus, just like, you've cancelled the whole attack. He's very cool. Uh, then we have our first of our special characters, the Chooser of the Flesh. Uh, and sorry, the core styling for these guys, they're, they're elves. So they've got, actually, but not Eldar. They don't have the 3 APL, which I think is silly. 
They've got three movement, two APL, one group allowance, three defense, six plus save, but they have that five plus invo and nine wounds. Eight wounds for the rest of them. Bale Blast the same. The Bale Blade um, is four attacks, three plus, five, six damage, brutal lethal five plus. This is a guy with a double handed weapon and it has Reap too. So you get to do mortal wounds to people within, um, within range. And then Soul Harvest, each time an enemy operative is incapacitated as a result of this uh, operative's part collector ability, which is over here, or Bale Blade, um, including with the Reap hit, critical hit rule. Add one of your Soul Harvest tokens to your pool and two if the enemy operative has an APL characteristic of three or more. Yeah, so if you're a space marine kind of. Each time a friendly Mandrake operative is activated, you can spend one of your Soul Harvest tokens to either add one to their APL until the end of the battle, or it regains D6 loss wounds. They do kind of hulk up later on. Uh, you can spend your Soul Harvest tokens even if this operative has been incapacitated because he's, he's got the Soul Juice. And then it's Part Collector. Each time an enemy operative performs the fallback action with the engagement range of this operative, you can use his ability. And if you do so, the enemy operative suffers D6 mortal wounds before it moves because you just hooked that guy. Uh, they've all got like girl from the ring hair. <laughs> I don't know if you guys noticed that. It's very funny. Uh, the Dirge Maw, he's got his Bale Blast. He has a Glimmer Steel Blade, which is four attacks, three plus, four, five, lethal five plus, kind of a power sword. And then Horrifying Scream. So it's range of red, indirect soul, shri soul strike, just like the blast, but it's mortal wounds two and stun. And it's got five attacks, two plus, two, two damage. And then finally, Haunting Focus. Once in each strategy phase, when it's your turn to use a strategic player pass, you can use this ability instead. If you do so, select one enemy operative for this operative to focus on until the end of the turning point. When your operative, when your opponent would activate the enemy operative, if this operative is ready, you can activate the operative first. If you do so, during the activation, you cannot select any other enemy operatives as targets for combats or shooting attacks made by this operative while that enemy's operative is in the kill zone. He just makes you, he's like, he kind of hypnotizes you. And then period, periodolic projection for one AP. Select one enemy operative within shadow uh, or in this operative's line of sight until the start of the next uh, activation or that operative's next activation or until the operative is incapacitated, whatever comes first, that enemy operative is treated as being injured. And its APL can never be positively modified. Um, remove any positive APL it might have. This operative cannot perform this action while it's in engagement range. So he basically makes you like kind of paralytic, which remember in this case also lowers your defense against Bale Blasts, um, which is horrifying for some people. Now, this is for your cloaked guys, the Shade Weaver. You only get one, but you get the parts to make two. Uh, Bale Blast is the same. Glimmer Steel Blade is the same. So they all have lethal five plus. Uh, and then his special rules are shad sh sh Shadow shade Portal. Shadow Portal. Um, so for two APL, you can remove any shadow pool tokens on the table and perform a free shadow passage action with this operative. If you do so before and after it moves, place one of your shadow portal tokens within uh, white of this operative. So he basically creates like a little portal. And then weave darkness uh, for one APL, it basically is the, the bottom version of this. So remove your uh, weave darkness token, if any, then place your weave darkness token in a location that's visible to this operative or on a vantage point or train feature that's visible to this operative. And you can treat it as the intended target for the purpose of the visibility line. That token creates an area of smoke with a white radius and upward limit uh, and unlimited upward height, but not below. An operative is obscured if every cover line drawn crosses the area of smoke. And this operative cannot perform this action while it's within engagement range of an enemy operative. If this operative is incapacitated, remove its weave darkness token. Um, so it has like a smoke bomb and then it also has its shadow portal. And the shadow portal, any number of Mandrake uh, operatives can perform the shadow passage action each turning point if they start the action within white of your shadow portal token and finish within white. This does not prevent one op uh, operative from performing the shadow passage action as normal. You can use this ability even if uh, this operative has been incapacitated. So as long as the portal's still there. And then finally, um, you've got the Mandrake Abyssal, which is the basic dude. Uh, sorry, not the basic dude. This is the one with the, um, the super Hadouken and then the basic dude, the warrior. Uh, same course outline. The Bale Surge is like a two version of the, the big Bale Blast. So it's Blast or Stun. If you do the Blast, it gets Blast White uh, and Soul Strike and Lethal 5 Plus on the Burn. Um, same core, like five attacks, three plus, three, four, though. And then it has a uh, Glimmer Steel Blade. Its unique action is Wreath and Bale Flyer for one AP. Select one visible, op uh, sorry, one operative visible to this operative that doesn't have one of your Bale Flyer tokens. Until the start of your operative's next activation, uh, this operative's next activation, or until this operative is incapacitated, whichever comes first, that selected operative gains one of your Bale Fire tokens. The, uh, this operative cannot perform this action while it's in engagement range. And then Bale Fire. Each time a friendly Mandrake operative makes a shooting attack against an enemy operative that has one or more Bale Fire tokens, for that shooting attack, add one to both the uh, damage characteristics of that friendly operative's ranged weapons, and they have the no cover special rule. Because <laughs> you basically light them up for everybody else to throw Hadoukens at. 
Um, each time a shooting attack is made against a friendly Mandrake operative that has one of your Balefire tokens, subtract one from both damage characteristics of the enemy operative's ranged weapons to a minimum of one. And then your warrior's just got the Shadow Warrior ability. While this operative is within shadow, add one of the crit damage of its Glimmer Steel Blade, so it goes to four six. That's it. That's the actual. That's the actual like group. And let's take a look at some of their fun campaign stuff. So you're gonna get uh, Spec Ops from any shadows. While this operative is within one of a light part of a train feature, it's within shadow, so you can up your shadow game. Uh, Darkness made flash while this within shadow and more than red from active operative. Uh, improve its invulnerable saves by one, so like to three plus. Uh, Hungering horror, this operative can charge action while it's within engagement with the enemy operatives, just stuff like that. And then cool rare equipment, you get the spirit siphon. Each time this operative incapacitates an enemy operative, you can select one friendly mandrake within red to regain a number of lost wounds equal to the incapacitated operative's APL. So you keep like getting your wounds back every time you kill somebody. Uh, and then things that your strategic assets are things like a ghost glassed obelisk. Um, it's a unique amalgam of flowing stone, barbed metal, and mirrored glass, as dark as the deepest abyss, yet all serve the same dread purpose. They are portals to Aelindrak, from which mandrakes may creep and into which they drag their doomed victims. Uh, one additional mandrake operative can perform the shadow passage action each training point, so more people can go through. Uh, requisitions return to Aelindrak, uh, repurchase requisition before or after a game, take a recovery test for every friendly Mandrake. Basically, you just go home for a minute. And then your crazy, like, um, agendas, things like deal with the darkness, uh, operative, uh, operation ones you're bidding, a terror, a random terror spreads as the Mandrakes that are completing the task they've agreed to perform. Randomly determine the three tack ox from those available to one of your faction's archetypes, complete five games in which you score victory points from them. And then payment, Cap complete a game in which you score victory points from the capture hospice and <laughs> infiltrate. So you get paid by stealing somebody. Oh man. Uh, I liked, I really like this piece of art because you got to see what this planet actually looks like. That it's just this giant nightmare sea world. I couldn't really envision what they were going for until I saw this and it made me very happy. Uh, and then you get your beta decima kill team like rules again and then the nightmare ones. So rules for this thing, um, which give you like the first level, second level, uh, and what your engagement ranges would look like, climbing and dropping rules for the steps. And then cool narrative twists for being on the water, things like the currents kick up, there's whirlpools, hypnotic waters. Each time it offers incapacity, if it's within one of a hazardous area or within one of an edge uh, that's, sorry, it's activated. If it's within one of an edge of something or a hazardous area, roll a d6. If it's greater than your APL, you're minus one APL because you just keep staring at the water because it's talking to you. <laughs> or like an ocean predator might show up. At the end of the firefight phase, the players roll off. The winner must select one operative within one of a hazardous area or within one of the edge that's no more than uh, blue from a hazardous area. On a four plus, they take a number of mortal wounds equal to the dice roll. <laughs> Volatile machinery, coastal collapses, burning seas. Yeah, we, we start to understand what hazardous areas actually mean in this book because they start to have them be crazy. And we get our extra missions. Um, some of which are less symmetrical than others, which I think is really cool. Take the high ground, Anakin. And you can see here, this actually covering up the, um, the water is kind of neat. Escape the facility, blowing up facility, and that's it. That's the book. So, what do I think? Well, I what I love is both these kill teams actually seem relatively on theme. Like, I like the fact that your Nightcrawler bouncing around with the Mandrakes. I love the fact that the Night Lords feel like kind of jacked up space pirates. I, I love the Night Lords ever since the Aaron Dembski Bowden books, portraying them as like the universe's ultimate cynics, right? Where you have. Um, they're, they're like the only ones, they're like the comedian in Watchmen. They're the only ones that get the joke. They're the only ones that get that there's no heroes, that there's only one hero in Watchmen, right? That everyone's bad. Um, and so them being like, all, like very proficient at doing everything because they're just, they're, they're fighting the long war, I think seems great from the point of view of like a real design thing. I will say as this game goes on and on and on, I like this game. It's not light enough to be a skirmish game for me that, that is super accessible. Like, when I compare this game to Warcry, the weight of this game compared to the weight of Warcry is, ex is, is increasing exponentially, where every team becomes more bespoke and more unique. So while the gamer in me likes that, I do realize that Kill Team is kind of, kind of mentally going on a higher and higher shelf for some people. Like, even the language of the rules writing, it's very pencil whipped, it's very precise, it sounds like, like programmer jargon a lot of the times. And so, while that does great for me as a gamer, I do feel that for what type of game it is, where you click like a single box of models and play games, this is moving more and more into like the gamer territory and less and less away from the, 
skirmish game enthusiast territory where you kind of want to pick up every kill team in play. So I really like this box set. I really like what they're doing with kill team right now where we're slowly adding pieces to the puzzle of this like beta decimal like kill zone. I can see why this is no longer for everyone the way that the last edition of Kill Team kind of was where it still felt like 40K, just at a smaller scale with slightly more granularity. This one is all granularity all the time. And I would argue for people that like put other games on a pedestal, like being like, oh, Infinity's too complicated. Modern Kill Team is way more complicated than Infinity from the point of view of like interacting rules and unique rules and having to know exactly what your opponent can do tack up wise, like the level of memorization that's, that's increasing and spiraling in Kill Team while I really enjoy it, I can see how it's not going to be for everybody. So, yes. It's funny because I see Warcry is moving further and further into like the accessible for everybody kind of world and Kill Team running headlong in the other direction. <laughs> so, while I think it's a very good product for my type of gaming, I can see where it is diverging into the like almost computer game, x commy granular, techie sort of... Um, gameplay style, especially with the language and the writing of the rules, uh, that it, that's because it's so process driven to be like clean and mechanically, you know, like aligned. Um, I can see how it's not necessarily gonna be for everybody. That being said, the art in the book's great. The story's great. I love that there's like unique rules now for simulating the ocean and predators and things falling apart, but it's a lot and it's getting heavier every time we put one of these books out. So big thanks for watching. Let's see more GMG reviews. Next time on Ash, have a great